Hello and welcome to this presentation, Methodology, a must for complex FPGA designs. I'm David Clift, an application specialist for FIRST EDA. In this presentation we'll look at the increasing complexities of FPGAs and how this is forcing disciplined approaches to verification onto design and verification teams. In the presentation we'll actually outline a methodology using Jenkins as a project management tool controlling a Xilinx based design running through early design rule checking to gate level verification using class leading tools supplied by FIRST EDA. So the first thing we'll do is, part of the introductions, is to look at complex FPGAs and what are the complex problems that they're presenting us with. And then we'll go on and discuss what methodology we can use and what we need to do to select that methodology. We'll then have a conclusion and wrap everything up. So what are the problems we're seeing in FPGAs? Well, this data is from the Wilson Research Group's uh, 2018 functional verification study that shows that 84% of FPGAs have at least one non-trivial bug escaping to production. So that's a bug that basically you're going to have to do a product update once it's in the field. So these, these are quite serious issues. 65% um, of uh, typical simulation times exceed five hours. Um, so, you know, here again we're, we're getting to the point where uh, it's not the time to go and have a cup of coffee to complete the simulation. You know, you're looking at overnight um, and if you're starting one off uh, before you leave at the end of the day, uh, that's only one simulation that's going to be done at night if you're doing it manually. Um, also, we've seen a rise in the number of embedded processors within designs and now we're at the point where 64% of all projects are targeting an FPGA with one or more embedded processor. And also we're seeing, along with the increase in embedded processors, we're seeing an increase of the number of clock domains. So here, 90% of FPGA designs contain two or more asynchronous clock domains and obviously those themselves have their own particular issues that we need to address and map take into account when we're designing and testing uh, those designs. So looking at that graphically, you know, here are the, the graphs for um, non-trivial bug escapes into production, um, the number of embedded processes. You can see, you know, between 2016 and 2018, there hasn't really been much of a change in the higher numbers of processes, but uh, certainly um, you can see that uh, things are increasing. Um, the number of asynchronous clock domains, again, you know, over the years this has remained stable, but you know, the sweet spot is between two and twenty clock domains within a design. And one other thing that we didn't mention in the earlier slides is the adoption of uh, functional safety standards in designs, and those are driving up um, the quality and documentation needs for uh, projects. If we think about um, our designs and look at the cost of failure, things that have a, a, a severe cost of failure, let's say a flight system where if it fails uh, you can have one or multiple deaths, you want to spend as much processed on that as possible and the FPGA itself is a well designed set of processes. We have RTL design, RTL verification, RTL synthesis, FPGA implementation and routing and each of those processes requires different tests and checks. So we could look at RTL design rule checking, clock and reset domain crossing analysis, RTL verification well then you know just looking at the various types of verification we can do at the RTL level we can do code coverage at a very basic test we can then go on and look at functional coverage to make sure we're actually exercising the design correctly we can do robustness testing corner case testing and the list goes on you know so there is a lot of things that we have to do we have to do them at the right point in the design process and we have to make sure that they're all fully documented so basically a methodology uh, must incorporate 
uh, the best engineering practices that are available. So we want to do things like having coding guidelines and checking the code that's generated against those coding guidelines. We want single source documentation and by single source documentation here I mean things like um, memory maps for our design. We want a single golden source for those. Um, if we use the correct level of automation we can spin uh, multiple downstream products from that single source. So for example in the case of a memory map we could generate uh, RTL register models, RTL verification, uh, documentation, um, software headers for the software development uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, we want accurate project documentation. We need that to be kept up to date as the pro project evolves. Uh, we need to maintain a change history so we know if something changes and something breaks we can track back as to what changed t uh, before uh, the design failure that we've captured and we want to use as much script automation as possible. Um, script automation is handy because one it is automation in its own right, uh, it is ensuring that we do the same processes repeatably and it also acts as documentation as to what the process is because someone can come along they can look at the script and they can know what was done uh, for each level and uh, step in the analysis. Now the important thing with a methodology is it must work for all so it doesn't matter if you're a single designer working on your own or you're a member of a team of designers whether you're using one remote uh, compute server or you're using a whole cloud infrastructure that methodology must work for you whatever your team size is and or whatever your design size complexity is and as they increase uh, the, the whole solution must scale. So this is where we bring in Jenkins. Now Jenkins is a leading open source automation server supported by a large, a large and growing community of developers, testers, designers and other people interested in continuous integration and uh, continuous delivery and modern software delivery practices. Yes, it's a, another tool from our software colleagues um, but we're adopting it here into the hardware development process. Um, Jenkins itself is built on the Java virtual machine and provides more than 1500 plugins that extend Jenkins to automate um, practically any technology. Um, now this is one of the things that's key to us being able to use it because whatever you want to do there probably already is a plugin that will help you with that. So why use continuous integration? Well, the main advantages of using this um, CI approach is it improves the quality and testability of your designs. It allows you to detect and then fix issues in the design early. Um, it increases the transparency and visibility because as you'll see, code is continually being assessed and being reported on and that continual reporting gives us a fast feedback loop. So what happens when we're using Jenkins? Well, here we have our development team. They're busy developing HDL code and when they are ready, they will commit their changes in their code to the revision control server. The Jenkins server will then act either periodically or on change, depends how you've got it set up, fetch those changes uh, to itself and it will then perform a build test uh, process on that code and will notify the development team of the success or failure of those tests that it's, it's run. So looking at it in another way, uh, the HL designers commit their code to the revision control system and the Jenkins server fetches that data it will then spawn off various jobs. So the first one could be um, a design rule check um, and that will generate a report which can be sent off to the users and managers. It will then move on to run simulations, let's say RTL simulations. You know, we're, here we're showing multiple simulations and generate reports from those. And one of the 
benefits of Jenkins is if you're working in a cloud environment, you can set it up so it will spawn those parallel jobs across multiple servers. We'll obviously go and do layout, routing, and finally, equivalence checking. So let's have a look at a uh, Xilinx example for design rule checking, which is the first process we were going to look at and why we want to use it. So design rule checking is basically checking rules um, that we've defined for our FPGA design process. So here we have a rule, do not use both a synchronous set and reset. And you know, here's a description um, of why what the rule is checking for and here is a piece of bad code and here we can see the level that we've set it at in fact here we've actually found uh, an error in an encoder piece of VHDL and this is the piece of code um, that it's pointing to and as you can see we've got both um, asynchronous reset and set. Now why don't you want that in your code? Well certainly for a Xilinx device the underlying technology doesn't support having both a synchronous set and reset so we have to add in additional logic and that's giving us two superfluous gates that uh, we could get away with if we didn't have both set and reset. If we could have one or the other we'd be fine. So that's why we want to run design rule checking uh, to make sure our code is of the highest co quality possible. We also want to run verification. Um, we at first the EDA recommend using the OSVVM framework um, for VHDL verification. It's a framework very much like System Verilog where we have um, interface signals implemented as models, um, simpler interfaces could be represented as processes so for example we could in this case we could have a model for the CPU interface the RX the RX and TX um, those interfaces are driven by sequences of transactions from a test sequencer and each test is a separate architecture of that test sequencer so basically we have a fixed framework and we call in different architectures to run different sets of tests Obviously, when we're running those tests, we want one of the things we want to do is capture the data, be that code coverage or functional data, and merge that into our test plan. So uh, we can want tools where we can capture the test plan, uh, as here, where we're starting off with an Excel test plan, and we're merging the simulation results into that test plan. So uh, the engineers and management can see how we're progressing on the verification of our project. Next step will obviously be implementation. Um, here we're using Xilinx Vivado and Xilinx Vivado supports two flows. There's the project-based flow um, which is again easily scripted in T uh, TCL. Um, it automatically manages the design flow process. So for example if you asked it to let's say um, do generate a bit stream but the it, the synthesis was out of date it would go all the way back to the start of the process resynthesize re-implement regenerate the bits bit stream for you all automatically um, and if you need to you can invoke the Vivado IDE at any point during that flow there's also a non project based flow again this is easily to script and tickle um, but there is no automatic management of the sources for synthesis and implementation uh, and again you can easily launch the Vivado IDE. Now one would think because of its automatic management features we'd probably want to go with a project based flow but our experience is actually that the non project based flow is better uh, because it allows you to put in checkpoints through the, through the flow so it's possible to go back uh, to a step without having to rerun the whole process. So here is uh, an example script for Vivado and let's pull out a few features of this script. So here um, we're reading in the source files that we're going to use. So this will be our VHDL and Verilog HDL sources, but also our constraint sources, uh, which we also need to re read in. Um, here we're running a synthesis design. 
and here you can see us writing out the checkpoint for that synthesis so if at any point we want to run things post synthesis we can just start off with that checkpoint uh, here continuation of the script and you'll see in there um, we can run things like physopt designed to run the uh, physical optimization and actually it's although it's not been documented I've seen that it's possible to run multiple physopt designs to improve the design uh, more than just running a single one so again this is another advantage of the uh, non-project based flow that we can run additional optimizations uh, if required so let's have a look at uh, what the next step which is obviously post synthesis and post implementation verification and the first question we need to ask ourselves is do we need to do uh, simulation post synthesis or post implementation well basically yes we need to, we need to do something um, to check that the synthesis and implementation tools haven't uh, broken our design it's not unknown for them to have bugs in them they're quite complex software systems in themselves so question is what do we do do we get it in the lab and test it there well if we do that there are potential issues in that uh, if we find any a bug it can be quite hard to debug um, we've only got access to the internal pins although we can insert debugging tools into the design to bring out internal nodes but those in themselves could affect the timing of our design so it's not immediately obvious how we can do that um, we can run simulation on it um, but because we've now got quite a considerable amount of detail uh, in the design especially if we're looking at uh, post implementation net lists with um, delays um, there's a lot of detail that needs simulating there so you could be looking at uh, simulations that are not hours but are days in length um, they're quite unwieldy to debug and try and trace signals through multiple hot layers of gates um, but the next thing is you know you wrote all those RTL test bench will they allow for the real world delays that you're now seeing in the simulation results so there must be a better way and I'd like to propose using um, FPGA equivalence checking now this is based on formal methods um, and it's a mathematical proof that conclusively proves that your design is uh, logically equivalent um, to the RTL that you started with so and you can run this either post synthesis or post implementation to check that you are um, cycle by cycle you'll have the same outputs um, because this is a static analysis you don't need any form of test bench it will mathematically analyze your design uh, and tell you whether they're equivalent and if not it will give you uh, test cases to prove where they aren't so what are the benefits we've seen so far so the first thing we've seen is a consistent flow for all engineers which will ensure that you take all the steps and all the necessary reports are generated so you know we're ensuring that engineers follow a, a dedicated route and we're providing all the documentation that is necessary for the project um, for compute intensive tasks like simulation we can offload those onto one or multiple machines um, we can improve utilizations of, of the software license as a software vendor this is not something I really should be telling you but you know if you can run uh, multiple simulations one after the other on a remote machine you're going to get better utilization of your um, software licenses than if you're ha having them on your engineers uh, desktop machines and they're using them for maybe a couple of hours and they're sitting idle for half a day before they're used again you know um, you can get as much utilization and return on investment on those licenses uh, it's a scalable solution so it doesn't matter how your team grows or your design size grows the solution will scale to it and we're trying to increase the level of automation now we've talked uh, about using Jenkins and we've shown steps for the automation of the design but what sort of tools would I be 
looking to use that? Well, first of all, you need a good editor. Um, now, editors that highlight HDL syntax are quite common these days, but I would suggest that you should be looking at something like Sagasi. Now, Sagasi will not only highlight your code, it's built on Eclipse, so it, but it is also gives you type time, syntax and semantics checking of your HDL. So as you're typing your code, it's constantly checking it. Um, it gives you graphical representations of your design. It also integrates with a number of downstream tools like source control, um, Alien Pro design rule checking tools, and simulation tools. So it's it's a good point to start off with. Um, we mentioned Alien Pro. Well, Alien Pro is the uh, design rule checker, and this will take your coding guidelines and will automate the checking of those coding guidelines. Um, now this can be quite a time consuming part of your design review process and uh, because of that it's something you only tend to do um, just before your formal design reviews but when you have an automated tool like Alien Pro it means you can be checking those design rules constantly so yeah, we would say certainly when you commit your code changes to your uh, revision control database you should be every time you do that you should be running um, a, f a run of Alimp Pro to make sure no design rule issues have crept in so that means when you get to design review you've got fully documented set of tests that have been performed on your code and it, your code is um, to your design uh, HDL coding standards um, we talked about uh, one spin uh, or we talked about uh, Equivalence checkings for FPGA. Well, this is the one spin EC FPGA tool um, available for very quick checking of uh, logical equivalence of FPGA designs, RTL versus post synthesis versus post implementation. And if you remember, we also mentioned having common source. Uh, for your documentation for things like memory maps well we this is a new tool for first EDA Agnes's I design spec uh, that uses Word or Excel or you know just text editor to create a golden reference for um, your memory map so you can capture it in system RDL, IP exact, YAML, Ralph, CSV, Word, Excel as I said and from that you can generate synthesizable VHL, uh, Verilog system C, UVM register models, C headers, C, C++ APIs, uh, documentation, the list goes on. So a very powerful tool uh, especially if you've got large memory maps in your design and you know that's one of the things we've seen that uh, the programmable registers in designs have gone from maybe tens to hundreds in complex designs to even thousands. So in, in conclusion uh, this presentation has outlined a methodology for FPGA development based on the use of Jenkins as a cockpit to control that verification flow. By using Jenkins we can get a consistent workflow that is scalable from one to multiple engineers and scaled irrelevant of uh, design size. Uh, it automatically captures the best of engineering practices so we can enforce coding standards by using design rule checking tools. We can in check that our design meets the test specification by running uh, RTL verification and capturing those results into the test spec so that we can see that we get full coverage of all the aspects of our test specification. And the Jenkins environment will provide fast feedback to the development teams and management so if things do start going wrong we can quickly highlight that and move in and, and fix any issues that are being generated and as we mentioned earlier this is a scalable solution. If you do have any questions please feel free to contact us on sales at firstedda.com or visit our website at www.firstedda.com. Thank you for listening.